UV. Two letters representing one of the most fundamental techniques in 3D technology. Depending on your role, UV could be a tedious step in your workflow that you like to skip if you're a modeler. For VFX artists, however, UV is our favorite tool to create amazing effects. Today, I want to share five of the most used UV tricks for me as a full-time VFX artist. These tricks are definitely something I use on a daily basis to solve VFX problems, and I'm sure it'll be useful to you if you want to get into VFX. Let's get started. Okay, so the first one here we have distortion. This is a very basic technique, but I realize I haven't covered it on my channel, so here it is. First of all, this is just a texture sampling, a Voronoi noise. And if we want to add distortion to it, here's the note setup that we use. The first half of this is basically just a panner setup. And then we plug it into a texture sample. This is just a kind of low res noise. And then we take the R channel, we subtract it by 0.5 and then multiply it with the intensity. So how do we apply distortion to it as we add this value to the UV coordinates? So if we add a add node here, plug this in, and then plug this into the UV. Now we can see our noise texture have some of these like distortions on them. And then if we want to control the intensity, we just change this parameter, maybe say 0.5 and now it's getting really distorted. If you go very high to values that are over one, you get this re repetitive pattern, which is very similar to a kind of material called Damascus steel. So this is one way to create that kind of metal material. And if we add some speed on it, so once we added the speed onto it, it started to look like liquid or water. So the fundamental reason behind how distortion works is basically offsetting. If you look at my previous videos where we talk about offset, if we want to offset an entire texture, we also add a value to the UV coordinates, but we're adding the same value to every vertex. So we get a very uniform offset on the texture. So what we're doing here is basically we use this noise texture sample, which means every vertex now has a different direction for offsetting. Some's offsetting for a length of one, some are going 0.5, some are going 0.1. And that's how we create this distortion. And the reason we subtracted 0.5 is because the value range here is from 0 to 1. So after we subtract 0.5, we get the negative 0.5 to 0.5 range. Here's the material instance of the distortion texture. So now we know each vertex has a different offset value. And then if we started to increase the distortion intensity here, you can see that every vertex on this plane is getting offset, but by a different amount. And that creates this very nice distortion effect. The next UV technique is called gradient mapping. Now, for those of you who are familiar with softwares like Photoshop, you know there's already a layer that's called gradient mapping, which maps a 0 to 1 value to a gradient, and then you can decide what color you want, say 0 to map to, what color you want the value 1 to map to. Now, the way to do this in Unreal Engine is also by using UV. So here we have the same distortion material that we just made, and to give it some color, which is gradient mapping, we can just get a texture sample. And this texture sample is simply just a 128 by one texture. But in the texture, I have this gradient that I made in Photoshop. It's going from white to kind of a magenta and then eventually to black. So to do gradient mapping, we simply just plug the R into the UV and then we plug this into emissive color. And see now we have done the gradient mapping. And the cool thing about this setup is that I can just change the texture of the gradient and then I have a different feeling of the material I created. I also can use a kind of a blue green. This one kind of looks like a very stylized water, which I really like. So again, let's talk about the reason behind this. So if we just preview this node, since this is a grayscale texture right now, so the R value is actually pumping out a zero to one value. And now if we just directly take this zero to one value to UVs, this means that when we get a value of zero from this R channel, we will go to the zero zero of this texture and sample that color. And where is zero zero on this texture? It's the top left corner of this texture, which gives us this dark blue. 
Now, if we say the R channel has a value of one, it means it will sample this texture on the location one one. And one one on this texture is the bottom right corner, which is this teal color. So that's basically how gradient mapping works. We simply plug in what used to represent the value and we use it as a UV to sample a gradient texture. Now for the next UV trick, let's first look at these two discs. The material on this, I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with. It's just a Voronoi noise panning on this disc. But you can see the left side is the more regular one, which just pans on a constant speed. But the right one, we can see at the center, it kind of expands out faster. And then as it gets to the edge, we have this nice ease out slowing effect, which gives a kind of like a drag. It also makes it more like volumetric. It feels like it's a sphere rather than a disc. And the secret to this change of speed is in the UV. So if we look at its wireframe, we can now see on the left side is the regular disc mesh that we made. The layout of the rings is pretty constant on the distance, but on the right one here, you can see on the center, the rings have a bigger gap between each one. And then as it gets to the edge, we have more cuts on it. So actually, if we look at the wireframe, the UV difference of each ring is still the same but the distance and world space of these vertices are getting smaller and smaller as we get to the edge, which means if our UV have traveled, say 0.1, it will have a bigger effect in the center, but as it get to the edge, it will seem like the texture just traveled a little bit, which gives us the slowing effect that we see here. Now, the way we can make this kind of mesh in Blender is we go into the edit mode and then we make sure we're selecting the edge. So if we double click on any of the edges, we can get the ring loop selected. And if we press R, we can scale this ring loop. So what we want is to make the loops that are in the center bigger. So just make sure you're gradually increasing the gap size and then start making it smaller on the edge. Now, if you ran out of loop cuts, we can always just simply add a loop cut by using the loop cut tool. So I'll probably add more on the size here. So yeah, something like this will give us the slowing effect on the edge. It's a nice trick to just change the vertices on your mesh to control the speed of your texture. So our next trick is very useful if you're making some retro vibe games or if you're making a material for a surveillance camera, it's pixelization. So this technique can turn any texture and make it pixelized. So here we have a simple Unreal Engine logo plugged into the emissive color, nothing special. And now for the setup, if we want to make it pixelized, we take the UV coordinate, we multiply it by a parameter called pixelization here. And then we take its floor and then we divide it with the same value again. So we can plug this into the UV, just like polar coordinates, remember to put derivative on and then plugged in the DDX and DDY of the original UV. Now, right now it doesn't look very much like the original logo, but that's because we set the pixelization to 10 now, which is pretty low. So the pixelization parameter here means how many pixels is on our row and columns in our final material. So right now it's only 10, which is giving us a very rough pixelization of the original logo. But if we go to the material instance and we just increase this pixelation parameters, you can see we starting to get the pixelization of the original logo. Now, this is a very easy way to get this pixelization effect. And you could just change whatever texture you want to do pixelization on the texture sample. So the reason behind this technique is before the UV coordinates is going from the value of zero to one. Now, after we multiply by 10, which is the parameters value, we're going from zero to 10 now. And then when we take the floor, it's basically removing the decimal part of any values. So all the values from zero to one will now become zero. All the values from one to two will now become one. All the values from two to three will become two. You get the idea. Now, when we divide it by 10 again, we get this kind of like a step function that's going from zero and then 0 0.1, 0 0.2. 
And if we use that as a UV, it means that every pixel in the range from 0 to 0 0.1 will now sample the same value. It will sample 0. So that's why it gives us the pixelation effect. Now the last trick I like to share is using UV to create some simple shapes. You can use a sphere mask to create a sphere. And with the same logic with some different setup, you could create a ring shape or even a candle flame that's very useful when you're making something like fire in your games. Or you could even create this like sparkle star shapes with this kind of setup using UV coordinates. Now you may think why would this be better compared to me making this same kind of shape in Photoshop or something like Substance Designer. And the reason is because since this is all generated in engine, that means we can change these parameters in runtime and create VFX. So for example, here we have the star shape setup. And when we go to the material instance here, we can see that when we change the power, the shape of the star starts to change, right? The lower the power, the more pointy the sparkle gets. And we can use this to create some effects in a Niagara system. So what we need to do here is instead of using a parameter, we use dynamic parameters here. And we'll connect this to the exponential. So we name this power here in the details. For the particle color, we'll get a particle color node and then plug it into emissive. And now here's a Niagara system I created. This is a rather simple one. So basically it's just a infinite looping one which spawns one sprite and the sprite has the material that we just created. So the catch here is in the dynamic parameter index, I animated this value to go from 0 to 1 and then gradually phase out to 0 again. And then I scale the curve to 0 0.7, which is just clamping its value from 0 to 0 0.7. And now if we press play, you can see the sparkle gives it this expands and then starts retracting again. And that's how we create VFX. I know this looks pretty simple, but if we change this to spawn rate, and then we'll give it some randomness in the lifetime, maybe 0 0.5 to 1. We give it some randomness in the location. And then finally, some randomness in the size. And now we get this very cartoony effect. We didn't even use a texture in this material. And then we get some very nice motion of the stars like fading out, all because we use a material to generate this shape instead of a texture. So that gives us the power to animate its shape using dynamic material parameters. Yeah, so that's it for today's video. Here's the five UV tricks that I can think of. I'm sure there are way more tricks about UV that VFX artists use, but I hope these five simple ones can give you an idea of what VFX is about and help you in your VFX journey. Please like and subscribe if you find this video helpful and comment down below any questions that you might have. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.